Well, good morning, church. It's great to see so many of your faces here. My name is Jack, and um, although I'm a little nervous, it's a privilege to speak to you this morning from God's Word. And um, yeah, I pray that um, it will be helpful for you and that you will come away um, filled with hope in the gospel. Um, I'm a member of the AFES group that's come down to Berwick, and um, you know, this is my fourth year coming down, and I always used to think of myself as coming down from the big city to the country. Um, I recently learned that Casey, the population is going to overtake Canberra very soon, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's sort of turned on its head a little bit. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so it's maybe it's the other way around, I'm coming coming to the big city. Uh, maybe you guys should send some people back up to Canberra. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'd like to start this morning by just sharing a story of an experience I had last year, um, an experience of failure. And um, I, I had a particular course at uni. I study law and economics. And one of my courses, constitutional law, um, is a real tough course. And I remember thinking, I really want to do well on this course. And, um, uh, and I knew that um, I needed to put lots of study in, so I, you know, I, I put the hours away, I sacrificed from other courses, I put everything aside to do well. And um, maybe, I'm not sure I had the right motivations, but I was very committed. And uh, I knew that one of my weaknesses was reading questions, was misreading questions. Um, and um, sometimes when I'm in a stressful situation in an exam, not reading the questions properly. And I remember before I went into the exam thinking, no, I really don't want to make any mistakes when I read the questions about what I'm meant to answer and uh, which questions to answer. Often they give you a choice. And so I went into the exam very prepared and um, you can probably see where this story is going, but uh, <laughs> I came out um, feeling pretty happy with how I went, and I, I spoke to a few people, and I quickly came to realize that I'd answered three questions instead of two questions, <laughs> and so, um, and all my hopes went out the window there. But um, yeah, at that moment, I felt a real sense of, I guess, failure, um, and as well, I guess, a sense of hopelessness. It might seem a bit of a trivial example, but there's a sense in which I knew I had this weakness, and no matter how much I was trying to fix it, I still made the same mistake again. Um, I'm sure maybe some of you guys have experienced similar things and can relate. Um, I think we also see that in others, not just in ourselves. Um, but um, failure, I think, is most crippling when it's in our spiritual lives. And um, I know that I've experienced, um, had experiences of personal failure in, and spiritual failure where I feel like in my fight with sin and um, in my fight against temptation, I don't necessarily, um, I, I feel that despair or that sense that um, my a sort of hopelessness, like why should I keep trying since um, nothing will work? Uh, maybe some of you guys can relate to that. And if so, then this message is really for you. Um, so uh, why don't you pray with me and then we'll get started. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can be here this morning. And uh, thank you for the good news of Jesus. And we pray that you'll be speaking into our hearts this morning as we look at the passage. And I pray for all those who feel disheartened and hopeless in the face of failures. I pray that you'll show us how your gospel speaks fresh hope into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So have a look at the passage for me. Have your Bibles open. And um, yeah, so let's, let's take a look at the first two verses. And my first point today is that Jesus represents a successful humanity to God as fully human and fully divine. Jesus represents a successful humanity to God. Now, if you have a look at verses 1 and 2, it says that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, 
where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Now, for some of you familiar with the Old Testament, you might recognize this parallel here between the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness and the 40 years that the Israelites spent wandering uh, when they left Egypt. And um, if we go to Numbers, it says in Numbers 32 that the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation had done evil in the sight, that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And for the Israelites, the wilderness experience was one that um, epitomized their rebellion and um, their rejection against God and their failure in many ways. And when Jesus goes for 40 days in the wilderness, in a sense, he is doing what they couldn't do because he stands up to temptations and doesn't fail. And um, when the Israelites failed, it wasn't really just them failing. In a sense, it was also us failing. Um, in, in seeing the Israelites' example, we see our own failures. And uh, when Jesus goes into the wilderness and successfully resists temptation, in a sense, he does for us what we couldn't do. And so how do we see Jesus' divinity and his humanity? Well, Luke really wants to bring this point forward. So if you turn back just into the previous chapter, you'll see in verse 21 that when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, and heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, now Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. You can see here a really beautiful picture of the Trinity and, um, and Jesus' divinity on display. Now, moving on from there, you can see that the verse in verse 23, we see the genealogy of Jesus. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph the son of Heli, and you'll be thankful to know I won't go through the rest of them. (laughs) And it finishes with the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And the fact that it points to Jesus' descendant from Adam really emphasizes Jesus' full humanity. So as a fully human and fully God, Jesus is able to represent us successfully to God like we couldn't. My second point is that in choosing to represent us, Jesus chose human dependence and weakness. In representing us, Jesus chose human weakness. Take a look at the nature of the temptations Jesus faced. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 2, where it says, For forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. Now, what is being offered to Jesus here? Um, The scripture that Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy shows us the the way that true humanity, the way God intended, was meant to live. You can see man does not live on bread alone. It shows us the true humanity, the way God intended, was that uh, should be living in dependence on God. And when Jesus makes the choice to follow that, he actually represents us um, and uh, does what we couldn't do. And he chooses to live um, in human weakness and dependence. And if you have a look at the second temptation in verse 6, you can see it says, And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Here Satan is offering Jesus worldly glory in exchange for his worship. Again, Jesus follows the commandment 
have no other gods before me. And in a way, in a way that none of us has been able to do, he lives out that and puts Jesus first and puts God first. In a similar way, in verse 9, we see um, Satan tempts Jesus to cause a big scene, as it were, and throw himself off the temple for God to catch him, sort of presuming on God. And um, Jesus demonstrates to humanity he ought not to put God to the test. Just having a little closer look at verse 6, you can see that um, the temptation that Jesus, the second temptation Jesus faced here um, was a little bit uh, subtler and deeper than that. Satan offers Jesus glory and dominion over the world. You will notice um, that uh, when Jesus is resurrected after he dying on the cross, he receives this glory. So in a sense, Satan's actually offering Jesus a shortcut to glory, a way to sort of avoid the cross and the suffering that he would undergo in order to die for the sins of the world. And when Jesus chooses against this, he actually um, chooses human weakness to represent us. Um, And um, if you read the rest of the Gospels, the temptation of Jesus doesn't finish there. Um, I guess the, the greatest temptation probably he faced was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's crying tears of blood. And at any moment, as he says to Pilate, he can call down the angels, um, legion of angels to help him, but he chooses in his suffering to, um, to, to, to live in human dependence on God the way a true humanity should have. And... Um, And he does this for our sake, to represent us um, like we couldn't. You can see where I'm going with this as I bring you to my third point, that Jesus won the victory against temptation for you, to do what you could never do in your own strength. When Jesus refused to take the devil's fast track to glory and instead suffer on a cross, um, you and I were able to share in his victory. If you're a Christian, then the guilt and condemnation for your spiritual blunders are washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Friends, do you know this deep in your heart? Do you know the strong assurance that, in the words of Romans 8, there is no condemnation against you if you follow Jesus and if you have him in your heart? If you're like me, you'll need to remind yourself of this truth. When Satan comes knocking on your heart to accuse you and shame you, don't be deceived. Because of the gospel, you can have complete confidence in Jesus that your failures don't count against you. Because you have been redeemed um, by Jesus, one day you will go to a home that is being prepared for you in a new earth without sin or failure. Friends, I said earlier that in spite of spiritual failures, we might see in ourselves and others we have a reason for hope. I'd like to unpack this through three implications out of the text. These implications are expect temptation, follow Jesus' example in response, and don't despair in the face of temptations. So let's have a look at expecting temptations. Don't be surprised if temptations come your way as a Christian. We've already looked at how Jesus lives in true humanity before God the way we couldn't. If Jesus was tempted when he walked in true humanity, we can be sure that we won't be treated differently. Since Jesus is our head and he was tempted, we can be sure that we will also be tempted. Uh, Peter warns us that the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The temptations we'll suffer are not just, um, they won't be to turn some some stones into bread or something like that. It was a temptation for Jesus because he could call on God to do that at any moment. Um, But the temptations we face will be subtle and unique to us. So expect them and be ready with the right response. And looking at the second implication, the response we should follow is Jesus' response. Now, it might just look a little bit like Bible quoting. You know, something comes your way and it's like, I've got my memorized Bible verse, Satan. Um, It says here, and you say it, 
and then Satan goes away. It's not quite like that. Um, and um, yes, if we we know from Timothy that God's word um, goes right to the essence of things and is capable of discerning even the intentions of the heart. And God's word, quickened by the Holy Spirit, has a deep power to work in our hearts and minds. Friends, as we know God's word better and are familiar with all of it, um, we are able to, um, it's able to work in us and in our hearts um, and enables us to resist the lies that we face uh, when we're tempted. So let's read it regularly, value it and study it and seek to grow in our understanding of it. And that's for everybody, not just for someone um, preaching or for Bible study leaders or anything like that. We all have a role in that. And my third implication is that we shouldn't lose hope in our spiritual struggles. I mentioned that message of hope earlier. Um, and in the face of repeated spiritual failure, my question is, how do we have hope? And when we feel hopeless because nothing's worked how do we have hope? Um, we've already seen how we can look forward to a world without failure, and we know that one day everything will be made right. But where the rubber really hits the road for us is when we ask how we can have hope that things can change for the future now. Am I doomed to always struggle with my sin, lust, addiction, or my problem with envy or pride? Or how can I um, have a chance of something different if I always struggle with my temper or with gossiping or um, insert whatever it is. Uh, the answer to this question becomes apparent as we look more closely at Jesus' response. As we know the truths of the gospel better, they start to influence and shape our thoughts and ideas. For example, Roman tell, Romans tells us that we're no longer enslaved to sin and have been set free to do what is right. In my own experience, as I read and believe this truth, I found great freedom from sin. This truth was able to affect a change in me as I dwelt and believed it. One of the ways that Jesus' response gives us hope for a change now, I think, is in changing the way that we react to what causes sin. For example, when you feel weak, do you look to sin to feel strong? When you're lonely... Do you look to sin for comfort? When you're successful, do you turn to sin in pride? When you feel worthless, do you look to sin to find value? As I start to believe and dwell on gospel truths, we actually change the way we respond to those feelings. So when you're weak, know that Christ is strong in your weakness. When you're lonely, know that Christ is your comfort and he's always there with you. When you're successful, boast in Christ rather than yourself. When you feel worthless, remember the value Christ has given you when he redeemed you and died for you and loves you. So to, to wrap this up, uh, I've, um, I've sort of covered how we feel spiritual failures. Um, and I think this passage shows us that we can have a confidence for the future and a hope that things can change. We know that one day um, we can go to a world without um, failure and sin. And we know that Jesus has represented us well and um, represented humanity in a way that we couldn't we can look forward to a future home free of spiritual failings. But in the meantime, the truths of the gospel give us hope that we can put sin behind us and start to live following Jesus' example. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. So that God's grace actually teaches us to change. Um, I'd like to close in prayer as we commit these things to God and ask for his spirit to be at work in us. Please pray with me. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Lord, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to uh, go through the temptations that we couldn't do and we couldn't um, 
succeed in. And um, I thank you, Lord, that he represented us and represented the true humanity to God as fully God and fully man. Thank you that he chose human weakness for our sake. And thank you that we can share in his victory. Thank you that because of this, Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses and he sent his spirit to help us to know the truth of your gospel and for those truths to change us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.